Hi everybody, Quentin here from Modo. We we're at Modo HQ with Claire King, uh, a very good friend and a colleague who I've worked with for many years now. Um, and we're absolutely delighted to have Claire on to talk about um, legal stuff and being a lawyer in the energy storage industry, contracts, um, and everything we need to, to look out for. So um, Claire, absolutely delighted to have you on and thanks for coming in. Um, let's get straight to it. So what does a lawyer do in our industry? Uh, the answer question is advice on the law. Um, <laughs> uh, so, well, it's a, it's a few things. So obviously we do all the contracts involved in um, developing and operating battery storage pro contract uh, projects. Um, and we also advise on the regulatory side of things. So yep. ensuring that um, developers and investors, asset managers, etc., stay on the right side of the law and the energy industry regulation, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to talk about. It can be challenging because the regulation is pretty slow in terms of catching up with um, the, the current market. Yeah, so um, I, I guess a lot of your customers, so, yeah, and a whole energy se sector that is, that is, I almost said the word rigged there, it's not rigged, energy <laughs> sector that is designed for generation, right? We're trying to make energy storage work in that, which isn't really generational demand. So lots, lots to talk about there. Um, you've been around for sort of, I think, six years in the energy storage industry. We've worked on a lot of projects together over the years. Um, since, since I was 21. Since you were, yeah. <laughs> so um, could you just talk a little bit about what what you've worked on? And uh, of, of course, you work for Freeths now, who are, have a very big, prevalent, a very large presence in this in the space. And what, what do they do to, um, yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, yeah, you're right. Personally, I was involved in some of the first large scale battery storage projects in the UK um, back in sort of 2015, 16. So they've now been operational for getting on for five years, which is a pretty good track record. But yeah, at Freeth's, um, we've got a big energy, clean energy team. It's about 45, 50 lawyers strong across different legal practice areas, real estate, planning, construction. We've got a core team of energy geeks who deal with the tricky stuff like um, optimization contracts, the regulatory side. Um, we've got corporate and finance lawyers that do acquisitions and disposals and things like that. So that's the team at Freeth's. Um, and currently we are very busy on battery storage. I would call it our the, the sexiest asset class we're currently working on. Um, we're probably advising on about two gigawatts of projects at the wow. moment at okay. different stages of development. So yeah, pretty significant chunk of our of our current business is storage. And are you um, are you involved throughout the, the whole value chain? So I mean, from... Um, Supply, development, uh, contracting, building, operations, O and M, disposal, all of that. You do, do all of it. Yeah, we do all of it. So um, you know, right from the early stages when you've got um, the stage one developer pulling together land rights for the project, getting planning permission, securing a grid connection, do with all of that. Um, and then once they've compiled the project rights, they might look to flip the project to somebody else. So we deal with the acquisition or sale of the project at that stage. The due diligence that might be carried out on the project by the buyer we then deal with all the construction contracts to actually build it that might be uh, a wrapped epc contract dealing with all of it um wrapping in the grid grid connection works as well potentially um but we've also dealt with projects where all of those things are separated out so you might have a, a separate battery supply and install contract a separate balance of plant contract a separate grid connection works contracts that might be an ICP contract or or, or other. Um, so it can be structured in different ways, but yeah, we deal with all of that. Um, in particular, we look at the battery warranty terms because um, okay. it's, it's obviously <laughs> something we've dealt with before, Quentin. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, every time it's different. Every uh, it's time just, it's different. Ah, yeah. but, but it's so important in terms of feeding into the optimization services contract, yeah. which is something that our team of energy geeks deal with. Um, and... I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I? But it's optimization contracts are really interesting because they're just developing so quickly. There's no standard form. Every single one we look at is different. Every client wants something slightly different out of it. Every optimization services provider is offering sl something slightly different depending on the client's requirements. So, um, question on that: Do you do you work on both sides? So I, I know um, when we work together, it's, it's often been for the client. So for an investor or acquirer or you know that. Um, the, usually the folks with the money who are buying the service or the thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you also work on the other side? So do you, do you work with optimizers or folks selling these services to help them structure those contracts as well? Or do they tend to do that in-house? Uh, no, we work on that too for okay, optimizers. Right. Yeah. Um, so you see the pain from both sides? See the pain from both sides, indeed, yes. Um, obviously, we have to navigate conflicts in that regard, Oh, no, but, yeah, um, I didn't mean like that. But no, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, but it, it's actually quite helpful to see it from both sides because, yep. um, yeah, 
you if you're in the mindset of a of a provider versus um service uh <laughs> provider versus customer um yeah it gives you different perspectives and it's quite helpful to try and find a solution that's going to work for both sides because ultimately you want to get the contract agreed um as quickly and painlessly as possible yeah of course and we've had some painful ones yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you a, a very difficult question now, uh, but I want to know your opinion on it. Is this sector maturing from a contract put in a legal p- perspective? Or is it always... Because, okay, why am I asking this question? Well, it, the last few years, it's felt like the regulations and, the, and the, the way that we operate and the way that we contract for this stuff um, have not really kept up with the technology and the revenue streams. And it's felt like the, 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 the world of energy storage has almost moved faster than all of the supporting infrastructure. Like, and is that changing um, or is that gap getting bigger? No, I think, think it's changing. I think it's changing. Um, and the real reason it's changing is people are becoming better educated about the sector. They, they understand it better, particularly investors who yeah. tend to be the, I don't want to call them sl- slow, but the, in terms of understanding the market and how it works and, and how the revenue is realised. Um, well, I guess they got other stuff to do, right? <laughs> they got other stuff to do, yeah. But but understanding is definitely improving. So if you look back to sort of solar projects, early days of solar projects, when they first started to get rocks, I mean, I can remember investors saying, oh, no, 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 we don't want rocks because, you know, they don't have a fixed price and it's too risky and, you know. Incredible. N- now Incredible. they'd be falling over themselves <laughs> yeah. for a rock project. So um, I think that's where we're going to get to and we're definitely, we're definitely still on the journey, but I do think it's improving. Um, in terms of, if you're asking whether contracts are now standardised, the answer is that's a firm no, yeah. um, which is good news for me, bad news for legal costs. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so no, they're not they're not yet standardised. Um, we see quite a lot of variety, but it's because um, asset owners have differing requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so to go back to optimization services contracts as an example, some asset owners might want to have a floor price and they might want that because it's a requirement of their funder they need to have they need to be able to stick a fixed revenue stream into their financial model and know that they that is guaranteed for yep. the lifetime of the of the term of the optimization contract at least um whereas other asset owners will think well i don't want to pay for a floor because that's ultimately you do have to pay for it um i'm prepared to take a bit a bit more risk yep. for a bit more reward so, you know, that, that's just one example of two different approaches, um, which can have a significant impact on the, the form of the optimization contract. We're going to get out of rabbit hole here. With, um, forget the agenda, right? So um, floor <laughs> prices. For, for an investor who's investing in an asset, a floor price protects them against downside, basically, right? Doesn't yeah. it? It, may, it means that they're going to get, hopefully, a, a, a positive MPV or whatever. Um, are floor prices watertight? Um, and what should investors or asset owners look for? Do optimizers really believe? And I'm, a lot of these questions I have an opinion on. I'm just sort of throwing it out there, but I want to know what you think. Do optimizers, when they offer floor prices, um, are they are these contracts are they written to be watertight so that, that no matter what the, the investor or the owner is going to get its payout, or is it a bit more complicated than that? And what should what should we consider when we're talking about floor prices? Because I know you would have worked on a lot of them. So are, are they watertight? <laughs> standard lawyer answer it depends yeah, it depends yeah, yeah. quentin what is written into the contract um from an optimizer's perspective they're not going to want it they're not going to want it to be watertight in every scenario because if the market changes significantly they're not going to be want to tied in not going to want to be tied into it look at the energy retail market at the moment yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. prime example um so they're going to want certain caveats for sure um and whether they get them or not is a matter of negotiation so for example i mean one of the things that often comes up is um asset availability right if, you, if i'm not optimized and i want to write a floor contract with you and your assets only available half the time then of course i shouldn't pay out all of the, the full price and then how do you measure that availability and what if the availability is not your fault what if it's my fault yeah. what if it's the communication between our two systems and what if, oh man it's just we got so we've got so much further to go <laughs> you're bringing up some really painful Sorry. memories because yeah. I know exactly which contract you're talking yeah, about yeah yeah it's, um, um, it's, <clears throat> it's tricky you know uh, it and you can see tricky. both sides are absolutely in the right mind to want everything yeah um, and so yeah it, it, it's tricky anyway we've gone down a rabbit hole on floor prices well here's another one for you um, 
The other one is how do you to- hold your optimizer to account? How do you know if they're doing a good job or not? Yes, which is um, very tricky. Very, yeah. <laughs> very, very, very tricky. Um, we've got to be careful here because, of course, uh, some folks use our, uh, uh, well, a lot of folks use our data to, to do all sorts of things. And one of the things is that. Um, I guess the, the tricky thing about optimizers is for the last few years, we're really going off on one now, but the, the tricky thing about optimizers, and I know because I used to work at one, is that we've all been talking about the merchant case for storage for so long, and the merchant case for storage is so much based on how good you are at buying and selling power and forecasting and choosing when to do the thing that you you, you promise. Yeah. So everybody's been building these business cases, and optimizers have been doing an incredible job of selling their services before they've actually been operating assets in merchant. Yeah. And now we've got real assets operating merchant strategies, and you can see some assets doing better than others, right? And it's not just because of availability, and it's not just because of um, you know. Uh, systems, different types of system and thermal issues and lots of the things it's blamed on. Some of it is because optimizers are choosing to do different things. Yeah. And so you have to say, uh, at some point you've got to say, well, if you spent the last two years talking about merchant, let's see, can you do it, right? And yeah. so some are doing an awesome job and they're making incredible returns for their, their asset owners. And some optimizers are still clearly learning, they're on the learning curve. But the, the difficulty is if you've spent the last two years saying that you've got this AI neural network thing, and you're going to absolutely smash it, then when the push comes to shove, you really do need to. So um, I really went off on a rant there. I don't know how we ended up doing that. But we are not we are not the police of optimizers. We give data and we let our customers figure out what to do with the data. Um, wow, I really felt like I really had to defend, yeah. defend yourself. <laughs> that felt there. like therapy. Uh, so wow. Do you feel better after that? Oh, man. <laughs> okay, so um, what else are we talking about? Can you talk about a project you've worked on recently? Um, they're all interesting, but a particularly interesting one. Particularly interesting uh, and one. And some of the contract st- um, stuff that happened or the regs stuff that happened. The contract stuff. Ooh, we're getting really juicy now, yeah, aren't we? Yeah, I know. Um, so, well, what can I talk about that's interesting? Well, I suppose the, the interesting trend at the moment, from certainly from our perspective, um, is joint ventures in, yep. this, in this sector. So we dealt with one earlier in the year and we're dealing with two at the moment which are joint ventures between a developer who's brought projects to or is bringing projects to sort of shovel ready stage, ready to build, um, and are entering into a joint venture with a funder who's going to stump up the cash. Okay, right. Um, and what we're doing is putting in place sort of framework agreements whereby projects would be fed by the developer sort of into the joint venture and then they each take a share and um, and... And ultimately, the aim is to build a portfolio of a certain, you know, hundreds of megawatts, typically even over a gig of uh, gig of projects, um, hold it for a certain period of time, prove it, prove the operational capability of the portfolio and then refinance or exit in some way. Yeah. So um, that is definitely a current trend we're seeing. As I say, we're, we're doing two of those at the moment, um, and I suspect that's a trend that will continue. So how does this work? So um, why, is, why is this good for the developer and why is it good for the asset owner? So I guess that just thinking it through, the developer, they know that someone's going to buy their sites, and so they can, but they do they keep some of the upside? Yeah. 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 Typically, it, well, again, it depends on the negotiating yeah, position. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, so it gives, it gives the developer security that somebody's going to buy these projects once they're developed yep. to a certain stage and provided they meet certain investment criteria um, and each investor will have slightly different investment criteria but if you can set those investment criteria out at the beginning the developer knows what it's got to achieve in order to guarantee that it can sell the project into the joint venture which will then guarantee that the investor puts the money in um, often through the joint venture the investor will fund the construction so again that removes the need for the developer to have to raise separate construction finance yeah, which can be okay. difficult there can also be a mechanic whereby the developer is compensated for it de- for its development costs up to the ready to build stage so it might developer might take the risk for you know a, a few years actually while the project is developed and um, getting developed through to having its um, all of its project rights in place so land planning grid but as soon as that project satisfies the investment criteria, they can be reimbursed for those costs. Okay. Um, the construction costs are then taken care of through the joint venture, and then um, you know it's operational costs. Often the um, often the developer is retained as the asset manager. Okay. Um, Post energization, so they've got again a revenue stream coming from the asset management services. Back to your original question: Do they still have a stake? Yes, typically is the answer. the The share of the the share of the joint venture between the investor and the developer tends to vary. It depends on 
depends who's stumping up what cash and um, yeah. who's taking what risk. But um, but yes, typically the divest- the developer will re- retain a stake. And when the joint venture exits from the portfolio, either refinancing or selling it, they will take a chunk of that. Okay. And I guess it makes sense for the investor too, because they don't have to go through the beauty parade of looking at sites. So, oh, they, know, they, they know they've got the sites, they know they've got to meet some certain criteria, they can just get on and build them. Which, yeah. Um, and they know they're comfortable with the developer. And we yes. can, you know, we're looking to agree template contracts for all of this stuff. I mean, it's... It's the it, it's the dream, isn't it, to have a cookie cutter contract that you can just replicate for a number of projects and never exactly works like that in practice. Yeah. But the more you can get contracts agreed up front, the better. Yeah, so yeah. things like things like an EPC contract, optimization services as much as possible, the form of the sale and purchase agreement by which the the project company in which the project rights are held are transferred to the joint venture, all of that can be agreed up front. And then as projects start to come through the framework, you just sort of apply those template contracts to each project. So in theory, it makes the negotiation um, and document development process much simpler. And from an investor's perspective, they're not negotiating with multiple different developers, each having slightly different terms or, or very different terms. It's in theory, the whole process is much more streamlined. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Um, and I just want to talk to you about grid connections because they're a bit of a hot topic at the moment. And yeah, I know you you see a lot of them. Um, so the, the the story right now in the market is that uh, any grid connections for 2022 are really, uh, they're, they're worth gold, right? <laughs> they're worth away in gold. And uh, so a lot of connections are available for 2023, 2024 and beyond. So a lot of connections, you know, there's still, there's still a, a bottleneck here. And so... What are you seeing in the grid connection offers, or how are you seeing the uh, what's available change to as the as the market's changing? So uh, we're talking about um, active network management um, connections before, and what other things? Yeah, yeah. So what what can you just talk through some of the things that folks need to think about when they are getting grid offers? So what we're seeing at the moment is actually is a lot of grid offers that were for things like peakers, gas yeah. peakers, um, being changed to battery storage and even with the capacity significantly increased so we saw one that was a started life as a 49 meg gas peaker and is now a 99 meg battery awesome Um, i mean just just yes for the world yes (laughs) yes for the world uh, um the battery for the win yeah Um, exactly it's a a win for the planet um actually oh no oh no 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 no, 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 another rabbit hole no don't go down that um (laughs) it's better than gas peakers so the challenge there is that um Obviously, there will be an original grid connection offer covering the, to use this as an example, 49 meg gas peaker. There'll have then been a dialogue between the developer and the DNO to say, well, actually, can we can we switch this around a bit? Generally, there would then be a replacement connection offer saying, okay, instead of your gas peaker, you can have your 99 meg battery. So you've got two live connection offers and the developer has to choose which one to accept. Okay. So... What, what we've seen recently is the documentation not being exactly up to scratch. So you've got to be, I suppose my, my recommendation for developers is make sure you get all of this documented properly because when an investor comes to due diligence it, they're going to be picking holes in it. They want to see exactly which connection offer you've accepted. They want to see that it's accepted within the acceptance window. They want to see that you've paid the, the deposit promptly. They don't want any any yeah. risk of a technical breach of the grid connection offer because because as you know if you lose your grid connection offer you're stuffed. Yeah. And I guess one of the important things here is that a um, a one megawatt as a bad example a fifty megawatt grid connection offer yeah. does not equal a fifty megawatt grid connection connection offer elsewhere necessarily right because they can be different DNOs with different forms and different pay different. Um, amounts that you need to pay and when you need to pay them and, and some conditions that may be in that good connection offer. So um, are you seeing DNOs be more creative? I guess DNOs are under pressure. They've got a, um, we had Ed Porter on a, on a podcast and we're talking about how much we need, you know, we need hundreds of megawatts, uh, gigawatts more connections soon. So DNOs are under pressure. They've got to get people connected. So they're saying, okay, how can I, how can I get more connection offers out there? And so what they're doing is uh, they're putting in conditions and, and, and things. Yeah. So, so um, which is fair enough. You can see what, as is always the case, you can you can see why everybody's doing this stuff. So, um, what do developers need to look out for in good connection offers? I guess the first thing is read the offer. Read the, <laughs> read yes. the offer. So the often first. people don't quite yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yes. or no, they'll they'll read the first line that says you know 
50 meg or whatever. You think, oh, I'm fine. Yeah, um, they get the Moe out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Boop. Um, yeah, read the connection offer. Um, from a legal perspective, it's make sure you comply with all the terms, including any special conditions. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, coming back to what I was saying before, it's exactly what an investor is going to be looking for. I mean, I'm talking as somebody who would be due, diligen- due diligencing a grid connection offer for an investor, and that's exactly what I look for. Yeah. Have there been any technical breaches? If I know that certain DNOs do not issue formal documentation to record everything around this stuff. Yes. So a lot of it is dealt with through, I mean, I- ideally email correspondence, because then the- at least there's a written yeah. record. A lot of it's done with done by phone. So that is another big challenge. Um, so again, advice to developers, get it all down on paper so that you can, so that an investor coming in can see exactly how um, the grid connection has developed, how all the challenges have been overcome and how you've got to the end point, which is acceptable for the project. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about something a bit different now. So um, lawyers in, in our world, and I'm going to give you a bit of a layup here. So when should a lawyer be involved in the process? And the reason why I'm asking you this is, um, uh, this isn't to fear mon- scaremonger, but um, we uh, many projects some, that, that do go wrong could have benefited from some, some sort of support earlier, earlier on, right? And so the, spending some money up front can often save some considerable money later. Yeah. So could you just give some examples of, um, how getting a lawyer involved early can um, can improve the returns of a project, and um, when folks should be calling up you and Freeth and saying, uh, you know, let, let's let's do this. I want to want to talk and get let's you involved. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's do some law. Um, okay, well, I can give you an example actually because we've had one quite recently where um, so when. I'm talking here about very early stage project development when uh, the f- stage one project developer is securing land rights yep. to actually develop the battery. Often what they'll do is have some sort of um, informal agreement with the landowner to say, you know, we've got exclusivity over this site for a certain period of time while we go off and check that we can get planning and, and grid connection. And By informal, do you mean just like a, a handshake or...? No, uh, no uh, doc- documented, okay, but, right, yeah. but often sort of non, often non-binding. non Okay, right. But the first, the first binding document they'll enter into is is an option for lease, typically, yes. of the site. Now, the option agreement will have attached to it the form of lease. And once you enter into the option, the option will essentially say, once you, the developer, have got planning and grid connection offer, you will then um, exercise the option and enter into the lease. Okay. Now, when you sign the option agreement, the lease, the form of lease is attached. And once you've signed the option... Um, not when you've not when you've exercised the option, when you sign the option agreement, i.e., before you've got planning and grid, it's then very difficult to change the form of lease. So you've got to make sure you've got the form of lease right from the outset, okay. i.e., when you enter into the option agreement. Does all of that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So yeah. even before you've you've actually signed, you're in the lease when you're just signing an option, so you're allowed to take the lease. And if, I'm not, I'm, it's giving you not, an option to enter into the lease at some then, point in the future. You need to be damn sure what type of lease you're going to be involved in later on, as a layman's exactly. interpretation. Exactly, okay. because you can probably make sort of minor amends to the lease, but you you can't make material changes. And the problem we've come up against recently is that the lease is then entered into in the form that was attached to the option agreement way back when, when the project was originally developed. And the form of lease isn't what we would call bankable. It means if if a funder or an investor coming in at a later stage were to look at it, they'd say, well, I don't really like that provision. Okay. Um, And then you're stuffed because you've you've entered into your lease. And unless your landowner is feeling generous and will let you amend the terms of your lease, the project might not be bankable, i.e. you might struggle to refinance it or sell it. Tricky. Well, um, this word bankable, what else do, do, do we need to consider when we're talking about bankable? Because what, what else comes up in those conversations that people need to consider? Well, because everybody, because unless you're, unless you're, I don't know anyone who's going to be financing this out of their own pocket, right? <laughs> Other, you know, yeah. Mortgaging the house, it'll be a blooming big house. <laughs> so everybody needs some external finance and all those yeah. external finance people need some, some to, 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 be, to be comfortable. So what else can, can, can we look out for to make sure they're going to be comfortable? Other than the, the stuff we've just mentioned. Yeah. So, um, well, sort of, a, 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 you need to look at every document, basically, every legal contract to ensure that it's got the right provisions in it that um, that will satisfy a funder coming in at a later stage. Now, that can be provisions in the EPC contract, defects liability periods, that yeah. sort of thing, LDs, liquidated damages. Um, 
It can be well, it can be things like the floor and the optimization contract and the and the caveats around that. Yeah. I mean, the difficulty is that every funder is going to have a slightly different view of what is bankable and what isn't bankable. Um, so all we can do is based on our experience in the market say this is what people tend to want. So the more you can make provision for those sorts of things in contracts from an early stage, hopefully the less the fewer changes you'll have to make when it comes to actually um, looking to exit the project. That's an important distinction, right? It's because the word bankable is subjective. Being bankable is subjective. It's the opinion of the folks at the bank or the investor and what they think is common sense, right? So there is no bankable or non-bankable. There's just like, how much can you ensure, de-risk that someone's going to look at this and say, oh, this doesn't feel right. yeah, just just wanted to make a distinction because we we say the word bankable or we hear the word bankable all the time, and it's a bit more complicated than that. Yeah, it's not a six strict set of criteria, that's for sure. Um, and I just want to finish up on a on a uh, question, which is, what are the regulatory hot potatoes for energy storage at the moment? So I remember a few years ago, you know, we worked on um, the idea that, and this is still still the case, some distribution connected assets can be both exemptable from generation licenses and generation license holders at the same time right? yes. for embedded benefits and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so um, that was just a funny gray area that, that we worked on. I, I know there's plenty more. So um, what are the hot potatoes right now? What, what, are, the, what are the gray areas that, that um, the energy storage industry is trying to come to terms with, if you like? Well, there's the biggie, which is that we don't have it, storage isn't recognised as a separate asset class in energy regulation yes, at the moment. Yeah. It's sort of shoehorned into generation, and obviously it isn't generation. In now, the grid code and, and all that, right? Yeah. Um, and all of those changes are coming, apparently, but coming pretty, pretty darn slowly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's big challenge number one. Now, some of the problems around that have been solved, like there was the issue of double charging. Yeah. So you'd get charged in an industry charges on the electricity that was imported and then as you charge the battery and then you pay the same charges again as the electricity was discharged back oh, onto it's the grid. Oh, cra- so crazy. I mean, obviously it's changed now, but you can't can't believe that that was the, the way that it worked. But it was for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now that has been solved. So, so what, what essentially is happening is that small fires are being fought yeah. But the big the big fire hasn't yet been fought, which yeah. is that storage is shoehorned into generation. It just doesn't really belong there. So, which is a very big piece of legislation that needs big changes. I guess. And it's not just one piece of legislation, right? It's yeah. it's you know there is there's the legislation, but then there are all the industry codes. You know, you mentioned the BSC, um, grid code, all of that stuff. All all of it needs amending. It all needs to be aligned. I mean, and and you know. It's, Storage is just a, a tiny piece of the jigsaw, right? Because the whole thing needs to be upgraded to reflect the decarbonisation and um, yeah. decentralisation of the electricity system. And so um, I just want to f- finish off with, um, I want to talk about, are you involved in hydrogen at all? Any hydrogen projects? And um, I know this is an energy storage podcast, but I thought, well, we've got you on. I thought you'd have an opinion on um, the state of hydrogen projects and the, the state of the, the, the hydrogen world out there, because we're taking a very close interest in it. It's important to everybody right yeah well whatever your opinion on there you can't just have an opinion on hydrogen because it's a varied thing but whatever your opinions are on each stage of of the of the, the new art of hydrogen that is, that is appearing it matters to all of us yeah so um so what, what what are you seeing from your vantage point well we're like you we're watching it quite closely um and obviously it's relevant to lots of different sectors so that you know there's energy generation I'm not sure it's gonna actually be an important part of the energy generation mix um could be part of the energy storage mix Mm -hmm. could be part of the heating solution could be part of the transport solution but wherever wherever it is going to end up being used we need hydrogen production ideally green hydrogen production rather than blue we need some sort of hydrogen distribution solution you know, there's talk of repurposing the gas grid for hydrogen, but as far as I, I'm, I'm no metallurgist, um, but as I understand it, you'd need to blend hydrogen. Yeah, some work that. to be done there. Yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not an easy solution, let's yeah, just yeah. say. And then you need hydrogen production. Uh, sorry, storage somehow. You know, if you're going to produce large amounts of hydrogen, you've got to store it somewhere while you're waiting to then distribute it. Unless, unless we end up with a highly sophisticated, you know, production and just in stores. time hydrogen model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a really interesting market. We're watching it really closely. There are lots of opportunities there, lots of challenges too, I'm sure. 
Um, what I would like to see as a as a clean energy lawyer, I'd like to see green hydrogen, you know, so hydrogen production facilities co-located with wind and solar and potentially battery storage and, and other good stuff. So hydrogen hubs. And I think at the moment, the hydrogen hubs that are being discussed are more sort of blue hydrogen hubs. So um, production with CCS. Um, yeah, I would like to see that transition to something a little okay. bit cleaner. And I, t- I told you the last one was the last question, but while we've got you on, one more. So what do you want to happen, right? What does the energy sector need? You, 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 you're involved in, with, with, with uh, all stages of um, not just energy storage, but all sorts of uh, projects. And of course, your team are looking at uh, the regulations and working with government and all, and all that stuff. So what do we need? We, we, we've had a lot of big announcements recently. What are the problems that we need to solve in the next 10 years? I'm really putting you on the spot You're here. really putting me on the spot. I mean, I would say this as a lawyer, but the regulations, the regulation needs to catch up. Um, and I appreciate it's a challenge because the market moves so quickly. Um, it's really, really difficult to keep pace, but the regulation has fallen way behind. Um, so from my perspective, that would be that would be a really helpful, helpful solution if we could have a... Uh, a full regulatory regime, not just the legislation, but also all the industry codes that reflects the modern electricity market. Okay. And is can I can I have a second ask? Yeah. Also future proofed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> easy, easy peasy. Easy. Um, all right, so um, we're going to leave it there. I just want to say thanks, thanks to Claire for coming on, and um, thanks to everybody who's, who's watched this. Of course, please do like, share, subscribe, and, and all the good stuff. Um, and we will be uh, we'll be with you soon with another video. Thanks very much.